and Maverick Awards for giving uh, opportunity to such a lovely jury over here and the session is going to be exciting. Uh, with me I have uh, Narayanan with me, I have Jay, Shruti and Ashwati who are all veterans in the industry and have been doing some kick-ass jobs and uh, definitely being a challenger agency and doing great job means a lot. So I have full respect for everyone over here. So before uh, we move, uh, what we are right now going to talk about is uh, consumer behavior in a more traditional approach. Uh, we See, I personally have witnessed advertising, transforming to marketing, getting mixed up as a digital branding and then performance. So many things has happened, a lot of potpourri in the last 20 years or two decades, I would say. Uh, but yes, the methods have been uh, almost same. The tools have changed. So let's understand from all the people over here that how things have changed. So my first question goes to Mr. Rathor. Uh, so how can we think and uh, define the evolution of consumer behavior in the overall landscape? So uh, Mr. Jay Rathod here. So I think we all will agree that uh, post pandemic consumer behavior has changed drastically uh, in terms of more of digital content consumption compared to the traditional pieces. But now I feel consumers know that they don't expect convenience. They know that they should have convenience before taking any decisions because that is by default an understood parameter. And I feel traditional is still alive, but it's just wearing different clothes like TV and print taken care by OTTs and other programmatic advertisements. So are we saying there is a complete uh, convergence of multiple mediums into one and uh, we are having multiple touch points from which we are deriving the data sets and then we are deciphering the overall consumer journey to tackle the entire core messaging of a campaign? Uh, yes, because nowadays because of a lot of data analytics and behaviors, we get a lot of insights that what should even a traditional campaign be, which was not the case earlier. Because now we know how do we want to appoint a billboard and run a geo ads and based on that how do you digital retarget the customers. So behavior is always going to be hybrid and a 360 degree approach which has always worked. Uh, Narayanan, I would definitely want to you to add some points over here. You have been a veteran in the industry and that too in a mainline category. So. What uh, Mr. Rathor said, uh, I totally agree to that. What's your point of view? Yeah, it is basically, I also completely agree. I think the whole strategy has to be consumer centric and, uh, and media agnostic, I would say. There's no traditional media, no digital media. It's all how are you going to clearly engage the consumer better? And using kind of, I would say there are three cornerstones of a strategy, which is all about data, insights, and now technology to see how you can create a be better engagement and a kind of more relevant and be more communication that's more relevant to your target audience. I think that's where the whole medium transformation or the paradigm shift is happening. Thank you so much. Uh, now moving on to my next question, I think uh, Narayanan will be the best person to answer this. Uh, so we talk a lot about personalization today, right? Uh, so we have moved from prime time to me time. It's no more nine o'clock show. I can consume data whenever I want to, right? It's my YouTube, my Netflix, my Amazon Prime, even short formats on Instagram, right? So today my content is my content and uh, my feed is my feed. So in, in a generation like this, in a situation like this, how are we looking at this personalization at scale? What can we do, all the marketers should be doing? Okay, first of all, I think, yeah, personalization, is definitely the way forward, but it needs to come with a scale. So just to give an example, I think uh, the biggest example, and you mentioned Netflix. Let's take Netflix. Now, once Netflix definitely reaches and serves millions of customers, but what they do is they have an algorithm which is based on data, data learnings, which is all about a K, it's called K nearest uh, learning or K nearest neighbor algorithm due to which they look at lay, you they go to look at your historic data ratings preferences and then they use this algorithm to deliver personalized recommendation content recommendation to you i think that's the that's a perfect way where yes it is generalization it's across everyone it's for netflix it's for everyone 
but they make the user feel so personalized and kind of so kind of uh, exclusive that you are wedded to Netflix. And data also says that based on the content recommendation, 70 or 80 percent of those shows are being watched by consumer, and it helps will build loyalty as well. So this personalization at scale, this exactly comes in using the data better. That's what I would say. Yeah, but at the same time, it's also the scale that's important. You can't do a kind of just in one market, do a personalization campaign and do a targeting using digital. No, I, I wouldn't feel so. That will give us the kind of business outcomes which one would expect from a campaign. So I think that's how I would address this question. Just to enlighten me a bit, can you give a live example that you have executed something in the space? Yeah, I think uh, one big example of where we used uh, kind of a TV medium to drive personalized expedition, uh, kind of personalized engagement. I think I'll take a brand called Cracks. Now, Cracks Raw, Cracks uh, Corn Rings is the brand. Now, it's in the fiercely contested marketplace. We are fighting against Lay's, Kurkure, Bingo, and if you look at a traditional uh, way of approach of a SOE, which I say share of expenses less than 2%. There's no way a smaller brand can compete with the giants. So that strategy had to be very different. As I said, there are three cornerstones which we looked at. We looked at insights, data, and technology. Now, this is how it actually helped the brand. And the objective was clearly to drive spontaneous awareness as well as trials. So first step, I mean, the target audience was kids. We knew that kids get fascinated by superheroes, try, try to emulate them, they try to enact them, they dress like them, they like to engage with them. So this is the first insight. Second, data. So when you look at, okay, if you look at superheroes, who are the top superheroes in, in a, for, for kids? So we found a character called Little Singham here, which, which came on Discovery. And that character was the third most watched character in TV, using the TV ratings. Okay, so the third step was to find a technology partner. We had a great partner, Extender, to whom we collaborated. And we created a kind of a AR, AR kind of a engagement strategy, which is very, very personalized. Now, the way we approached this, we tied up with Little Singham. We introduced Little Singham, cock, uh, sorry, cracks, uh, corn rings, packs, and there were six cards. Each of them, there were six characters. We used the six characters and put the packs, it put those cards into the uh, packs, and uh, we ran a TV campaign. We ran a TV campaign which was going with, with it around a higher level of reach and frequency. And the consumers went to the store, they picked up the pack, they opened the pack, they got the cards, they scanned the cards on the mobile phone, very simple. And the whole characters came alive on their phone. Now, they could interact with the character, they could make them sing, they could make them entertain. In fact, they also had this dialogue which, which says, Ata maji satakli. So they could be very, very engaged. So it was a character we gave them, it was an experience we gave to the kids, and we found a very high engagement. Now, in just few, in let's, let's say in a three weeks campaign, we almost had four, three million downloads or three million scans. And we were very surprised even after that the scans were going up, which means the kids have told their friends, their friends have bought the packs and they have scanned the characters and, and they have created personal experience. Now this is, this is how a very traditional TV campaign and with the right kind of tie-up or affinity partnership with, with technology as well as Discovery also created this whole uh, kind of uh, integrated communication. They made this TVC with Little Singham as well as they allowed us to use the Little Singham characters in our packs. So it created a holistic experience and this created magic. I mean the term I, I used, I heard this term in uh, few sessions earlier, that is a magic which needs to be created. And this is how you use all these three pillars, which is the three cornerstones, as I mentioned, data, insight, technology, to create a kind of engaging experience. And the result was marvelous. I mean, it is in a category like this, in a fiercely contested marketplace, the awareness shot up, trials went up from 64% to 74%, and it, the brand, it helped build the brand. I think that's how a traditional media, coupled with personalization, uh, gives a better engagement. That's a fantastic case study, I must say. Very interesting numbers. Uh, anybody wants to add anything? 
Yeah, I think if our feeds are, you know, super personalized, then why not, you know, have personalized communication from the brand side, right? Otherwise, as a brand, you, you're not really relevant. So one example I can think of is, you know, we used to work with Symphony, air cooler brand. So they have uh, more than 10,000 distributors across. So uh, they had run a television campaign and uh, they wanted to amplify the reach. Um, but the question was, you know, how do we do personalization there, right? So what we did is we have a proprietary tool and with just a click of a button, we were able to personalize this video for each distributor wherein, you know, the ad would play followed by the distributor detail, which was, you know, for that particular region. Wow. So there was a distributor name, the contact details, which were shared to all these 10,000 distributors. So they were able to get personalized video, which they could, you know, carry forward to their customers and potential customers. So when we're talking about personalization, I think it's also personalizing for your customer and also how can you take it to the next level and make it scalable as well. And also integrate your traditional medium with digital. Yeah. That's brilliant. 10,000 videos, I must say. Anyone else? Uh, I think uh, one of the greatest things about, you know, the advent of data with digital is that uh, we have been able to work with cohorts for a long time now. Like in the last decade, most of the data set that you get, you get with cohorts. But with personalization, one of the greater things that we're able to see with both the examples is that we're able to speak a language that only a certain set of people are allowed to know, right? So earlier it was that, you know, the millennials like this language or Gen Z likes this language. Right now you're talking to a small set of Gen Z doing, you know, have interest in a small set of shows, probably watching the same reel, same, you know, they find a corner of the internet that is their own. So when we work for, for instance, even in something like SEO, where we do a lot of content, right? So if you're working with something like Tata AIG, there one might think it's just car insurance, right? Everybody is talking about car insurance. We are just talking about car insurance. But what we've noticed is that the way people approach buying car insurance is completely different for each age group. For some, we need to convince them to start by buying a car. We need to teach them exactly what they need to look at. For a younger audience, we've noticed that more technical details about a car actually helps, right? So for instance, why ACO has ACO Drive is because they've noticed that a lot of audience want to be a part of the journey when you're buying a car as well. So we're talking about a lot more of the technical details of why an engine has to be used or certain, if you are looking at like an EV car, what kind of details. Then when you're looking at an older audience, you're talking about, okay, you have a car, right? So every conversation is different. Even though the personalization is not at the scale of just 10 people, you're talking to a small set of every generation now with even the large scale content that you're generating. So personalization at scale has been happening for some time, but now it's, it's uh, I think it's on speed <laughs> because a lot of people are able to do it better. Interesting. Yeah. Jay, I, I just got a question by listening to what uh, Ashwati said. You operate very closely with real estate. So do we approach the market of real estate also with personalization at scale or something like that? Yes, because real, real estate as a market is very hyper-local, right? Because it's not uh, a national campaign or a regional campaign. It's a very hyper-local campaign like an X project in Worli needs to be communicated differently than an X project in Andheri because the communication, the audience, the persona is very different than each and everything. So here personalization is at every pin code. It's not only about every age group, but at every pin code, the personalization changes for real estate as a market. So I feel personalization, but along with that scale is also important. And it's not only about just putting one name that dear Saurabh, it, it is not called personalization. I feel it's right message at the right time in the right format, in which you scale is, I think, which, which makes sense to advertisers, all of us, for a brand. Thank you so much. Uh, moving to my next question, I think uh, I'll put it to DBO teams over here. So, Shruti, so we have all seen uh, media buying and planning landscape from a traditional media landscape of print, TV, radios, moving on to digital media buying, planning landscapes, and then programmatic, then Google's metas of the world. I have witnessed it myself and personally over the last two decades. Uh, what used to happen uh, in mainline campaigns, we used to plan very thoroughly first, right? It used to take time, days, 
all those things, right? People used to believe, oh, is this is so difficult. Yeah, it was actually, uh, it is indeed, it still is very difficult. Uh, and once the plan is set, the buying is done, then the campaign flows easy. Operations team manages it very smoothly. In contrast to digital, it's absolutely opposite. Your planning phase is easy. Your buying is easy, your planning is easy, and your execution and controlling the overall campaign for the next 30, 45, 60 days is pain. It's very difficult. You just run the campaign on Google at 8 p.m. and you wake up in the morning and you realize Google has burnt all your money. <laughs> you just can't leave it to the mercy of Google, right? <coughs> so my next question actually comes from this only. So how do we look at campaign management and optimization in today's hybrid structure of agencies with young talent jumping in and so many tools, so many options available. So what do you think, how we do that, the campaign management and optimization? So first of all, I'm not sure if my team here would agree that, you know, digital planning is easier <laughs> than traditional <laughs> because, yes, end of the day, I think uh, the effort is still the same. And I am a total believer that irrespective of traditional or digital, it is the power of your idea, right? And that is where I think the new technology and data is really helping. Because earlier, if we had to get an insight, we had to talk to customers, we do in-depth interviews, we do focus group discussions. But now there is a lot of data which is available online, right? There are customers searching. Like, for example, uh, we were working for one of the international toy brands. And uh, yes, we did speak to young parents. Uh, we did speak to expecting mothers. But at the same time, we realize they're also asking a lot of questions online, right? They are, they are concerned, they're asking questions about what toys, you know, what diapers, all sorts of, you know, information is being gathered online. Um, young parents are also part of different communities where a lot of information is shared. So for us, when we are planning, all that is wealth of information that we can get really to understand who is this customer that we're communicating to, right? So I feel like, you know, this whole shift wherein, uh, you know, he was talking about post-COVID. I think the shift that has really happened is earlier there were digital natives. Others were just testing waters with, you know, uh, online shopping and payments and things like that. I think post-COVID, there is a certain comfort uh, when it comes to uh, using online platforms. So online shopping, payments. You know, the whole media consumption, I think, has shifted a lot to digital. Even, you know, if I want to consume news, I would go to X and see what's happening, right? I hardly pick up a newspaper right now. So um, what I would say is, you know, in terms of campaign planning, it is more about seeing, um, it's more about finding a really good big idea and then trying to see what are the effective touch points that we can look at based on the target audience, right? Um, so once we have that in mind, then it's also about how to integrate. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, we were working with World Tennis League. Uh, it is one of the sporting events in uh, UA in the Middle East. And um, so we did a completely AI-driven campaign for that. Um, because what happens is, you know, essentially, when you have to do uh, sporting event promotions, we have to shoot the players, right? And it takes a lot of time. Uh, permissions are required. Players have to come together for certain shoots. So what we did, and also the fact that, you know, if you take images from stock footage images, then, you know, you have other issues as well. So we created the mood boards and the all the images, illustrations, completely on AI. So our production time was then cut down from about 30 days to two days, right? And then what we did is there were print ads, there were holdings. So all these, you know, traditional channels of communication, we were able to do integration, you know, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, like, for example, in our print ad, um, we kind of recreated the whole venue in which uh, the World Tennis League was being conducted. Um, you know, we had QR codes for each part of the venue. So people could actually scan and experience what they would witness once they go to the arena. And, you know, this was actually redirected also to the website where people could book tickets for the event. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, once you have like a strong idea, then it's about identifying what are the sort of media channels I can look at irrespective of traditional or digital, right? 
So once you get that crux, then it's about planning and then taking it forward and making it to the next level. Yeah. Perfect. And how do we optimize the same then later? Once the planning is happening, everything is done, and the media deployment, how are we looking at optimization? If you can give, share some tricks. Uh, in terms of? Uh, the media deployment, uh, the paid media buying that we are doing. Yeah, uh, so, so we have a team essentially, you know, with, uh, with the objectives in mind that is set. Of course, you know, it's a different ball game, and we will have to. So I think with traditional media, what is happening is you put out an ad based on some insights that you may have and you expect results. But yeah, of course, you know, in digital, the advantage is you know the numbers, right? The client knows the numbers. So then it's also about trying to tweak at points where you think it is relevant. Uh, so, you know, if you find that there is a certain sort of audience who are not reacting as much as you expected, then you try different uh, demo demographic uh, cohorts, look at maybe different locations, look at interests. So, you know, the kind of targeting that we can do is really, really good when it comes to digital advertising. I think that's also like a big plus. Anybody wants to add something? Uh, I think one advantage of campaign management that we have now, like you mentioned, there is a lot of tools that are available, right? So uh, there are companies that thought that, okay, so we can now replace the agency and just tool calm kar lega, right? Because you're like, now why waste money? But I think a lot of people have burned their hands with this uh, certain, you know, surge of automation that has happened. Because one of the things that people have noticed is that for campaign management, still having that guy who understands the industry, to take his example, right? Uh, real estate is a great example. Hyperlocalization is so important. If you're selling somewhere in Bombay, in uh, like a lower peril, okay? So you need to know lower peril. Your automation guys are not going to know that, right? Your text is never, even with every predictive AI, your text is never going to be that salt of the earth that you want it to be. So I think one addition that I've seen is that that traditional aspect of it, having those guys who can have that kind of idea, ha understand the product better, uh, along with any of the tools. Like, honestly, all of the tools are just coming to their age. We've not seen a lot of well-optimized tools that can still replace the agency even 50% right now. But I think having that guy, that is the traditional aspect of it that I'm still excited by. Because I think that that is not an insight I've seen any tool provide. Hmm? Okay. Such a relief, Ashwati. We are not going out of business because of AI. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I say this every day to everybody. Yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs> so, with this question, I just realized numbers are playing a big role, right? Everybody's talking about numbers, numbers, numbers. So when it comes to numbers, we mean analytics, right? When we mean analytics, we also go into forecasting a lot, right? And with so many analytics tools available for free from Meta to Google to Microsoft Clarity, plethora of data is there. So what do you believe in how brands can use predictive analytics and trend forecasting in better planning of their campaigns? Right. So I think uh, sometimes uh, people say it's the curse of the data, right? Because now there is so much data, everybody doesn't know where to look. But I think uh, since ChatGPT has come into play in 2022, everybody has understood that, uh, you know, the uh, industry is on steroids. So there is data and there is one machine that could I mean, 80% of the times give decent insights from the data as well. But I think uh, one of the things that people need to look at when it comes to predictive analytics as well is that what you input still matters, okay? Because people think that because analytics has come into play, machine learning has come into play, the input doesn't matter. The output or the prediction is only as good as the data that it's trained on. So if the data that you've put in is trained on something very faulty, very large scale, it's still going to give you garbage. It's not going to give you anything insightful. So that's why the whole training aspect of data needs to be very important. So even however big the company is, if you're getting your information from Clarity or Hotjar, wherever, right? Website analytics that needs to go in needs to be actually deciphered by a data analyst at your end or a person at your end who can actually look at the data and say that, hey, this is the cluster where it belongs. This is the kind of person that it's looking at. And that insight, when put into a machine now, can give you, like he said, magic, 
right? The miracle of that data that comes out, it's very pure. It can predict exactly what your user would probably be interested in. I'll give you an example. So one of the things that we wanted to do with BFSI, right? There is a lot of information out there, but not all the information is accurate because when I write something, some other guy copies it, then everybody writes the same thing, right? Because that is what is happening. Now, what we realize is that the websites that our competitors are not doing something that we want to look at. So let's try to understand how health as a segment is something that we can learn about. So our team created a scraper that goes on Reddit and Quora and collects all data and questions anybody has ever asked about health insurance and then starts clustering that information, right? to understand exactly what kind of person is going through what kind of issues, and then maybe then create data or content pages about that kind of things, right? Because there the input was the person actually going through that information. Scraping has become easier, right? But uh, creating that tech at our end was something proprietary, but the, at the end of the day, the guys who have worked in the health segment were the actual game changers for us, who were able to then predict, okay, so these are the kind of pages, or this is the kind of you know information you need to put out there, that would help your clientele as well as become something new in the industry that others are not able to do. So, you know, that that is, I think, the best way to understand forecasting as of now. Mind blown yeah. already. That was amazing. Okay. So, uh, the time is also running. So, I think one last question I would want to ask everyone over here that, uh, so, somewhere we have transformed ourselves from traditional to digital in last few years. So what is the future of uh, traditional agencies with the growing digital world? How do you look at it? Is it a challenge? Is it an opportunity? How we are looking at things? Please. I would appreciate if everyone can add a point over here. Okay. So it's, it's basically, I think as I said earlier, it's all about a rethinking that's that to be done. You use data better, you collaborate with technology partners, you create engagement kind of a tragedy, or you create a kind of a campaign that will drive the KPIs for the brand based on the business outcomes KPIs. So I think it's the framework that's important. I mean, traditional agencies, I mean, there's nothing like traditional. Now, if you see, we talked about personalization, we are talking, these are all new topics, but if I go back, I mean, a brand which has been doing personalization in legacy years is Amul. They use current trends, they use data, they see topical ads. I mean, and the ads are also so customized and so relevant to that audience. Like, I saw a Bihu a festival ad, which had the Bihu girl instead of the Amul girl. So I think it's very, very, I think that's been happening since many years. These are all new topics, but the way the brand, the storytelling needs to happen, I think that's more critical. So it's the approach which needs to change. Like, basis at Alliance, we have to follow this a uh, four-step approach, which is reach your consumers, enrich the comp comprehension about the brand, create any or create and enable experiences, and then foster advocacy. Now, these are the four kind of, uh, I would say, cornerstones of a engagement or a communication strategy. So I think once we set the framework right, build on idea and build, build, build on or based on what the brand wants, I think that's the way forward. So it's using data better and insights better, maybe the data learnings better, forecasting better. I think it's all put together. So it's mixing creativity with data. So I think uh, traditional agencies brings a lot of experience in terms of storytelling and emotional resonance. So I think uh, they have to go now hybrid with adoption of digital tools, but they should not forget their core strength, which was storytelling and uh, emotional resonance, which I think is sometimes lost in the digital world of scrolling. And uh, at Coffee Tech, we believe the key word is balance. Balance between creativity and technology, balance between personalization and scalability. So I think it's not about traditional versus digital, but it's about going hybrid with the right balance between both of them. Ashwati, you want to mention something? No, I think with traditional, the only thing is adapt, adapt, adapt. Also, chat GPT can't replace your team. Just remember that. <laughs> but I think all the people working in traditional advertising go back home and do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, everybody is part of the same ecosystem. Not, not before going home, on the way. <laughs> on the way itself. Sorry, I, I still drive back home, so I, do, I can't do that. So yeah, so yes, uh, uh, actually the way forward is uh, we have to coexist. Uh, we are all digital natives in a way now. We can't live without an email, we can't live without a WhatsApp. 
uh, right? And the digital interventions are growing with every day in our lives. So whether it's a traditional agency or a digital agency, even the client, I believe, wants that QR code to be placed in their print ad, yeah. right? So uh, the amalgamation is beautiful. It has already happened. It's not happening anymore. It has already happened. So I think uh, that's it from my side. Yeah. And I would also just yeah. maybe add in uh, as a summary of all no, that please, you said, please, please. which I think is about uh, embrace technology and AI. Um, you know, earlier on, uh, somebody had asked uh, the audience, you know, how many of you use AI tools? And I just saw about five, six hands going up. Um, I, I kind of think, you know, AI is sort of like an enabler. And OK, you have the creative power use AI to your advantage to kind of supercharge and take it forward because there's just so much you can do and for the client also you know it's reducing production times uh, in terms of you know more efficient creatives at a shorter duration so yeah I think uh, for a traditional agency definitely embrace technology and AI tools and use it to a full advantage I'm sure, <laughs> we do I'm that sure. <laughs> वैसे पांच हाथे वो सब लोग use करते हैं AI they just don't want to tell. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone.